Hello. Hi. <laughs> My name is Antoine. I'm a Debian developer. I have many hats, but uh, Debian developer is one of them right now that I will wear here. I'm happy to wear other hats if you have other questions about Tor or community networks or nonprofits and shared hosting providers and cooperatives. And I've done a lot of things, but right now it's Debian. And this is the first Toronto Debian bug squashing party, I think, right? Which is a little strange that I'm introducing this, considering I think it's the third time I've ever been in this city. <laughs> I'm not a big Toronto person. Uh, every time I come here, I'm really confused by its size. And Anyways, um, and what we did last time when we did a bug squashing party in Montreal is we, I did a little session on packaging called Packaging 101 to get people more familiar with the process of how Debian packaging works. It's a strongly opinionated uh, session. Like there are many, many different ways of packaging in Debian. And this one, uh, this session is about how I think it's best to do it. Uh, there are other ways, other people are gonna have other ways. I'm not gonna present those ways. And I'm gonna present some of the fundamentals of it too, like have a kind of a streamlined approach that gets you kind of covered of, for most of the things. It's not gonna show you how to package everything into Debian, that's a much harder problem because everything is complicated. Like, uh, like if, you, if you're gonna package a C program that has a make file, we've got you covered, but there's a lot of things out there, like, like there's Python and Rust and Ruby, and so there's very, very different ways of doing things, so I'm not gonna go through that. Um, so yeah, I, let, let's just begin. Uh, who's a, how, how, like let's just by show of hands, uh, let's see how, how people are, are familiar with Debian packaging here. So um, who's ever used app get install? <laughs> okay, keep your hands up, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Uh, who's, who's ever used app get source? Keep your hands up if you ever use app get source. Okay, there you go. That's, that's getting a little more complicated. Whoever used dget? Ah, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, good, good. Uh, whoever used dpkg build package? Yeah, same. Oh, one more hand. <laughs> um, how about uh, dput? Gee, we get, we, get the, we get Debian developers here. We get like actual Debian developers. We get at least four people that know how to upload packages. Uh, how about Quilt? Still, okay, I'm, I'm just gonna get through all the <laughs> things Debian developers know about. So we get about four Debian developers and some Debian users and power users. Um, so this is basically what I'm gonna go through, right? Um, so I'm gonna go through what is a Debian package and how do those tools interact with uh, Debian packages. So um, I'm gonna kill my screensaver because <laughs> this is really annoying. Um, so a Debian package is two things. There's a source package, which is a little description file with the actual source, and then there's a binary package, which is a thing that gets installed when you app get installed. So let's say, well, let's say we start with that thing, the dot .deb. Um, it's the binary package that's on the FTP servers, which are not FTP anymore, but whatever, that you um, app get install, which we can just call apt install now. It's super exciting. <laughs> I'm really happy about that. Um, so that's stuff everybody knows. Um, well, not everybody, but um, before that, you have a, a, a source package, which I'm going to put DSC there, like it's the Debian source control file. It's a little text file that's next to the source. Um, and to get to the Debian binary package, you use build package. Oh my god, I'm already going to run out of space. This is horrible. So take the source package, build the binary package. I think most people are familiar with that as well. Um, and to get the source package, you're going to use app source, as I talked earlier. 
You can also use dget. Um, and here the idea is app get, app get source or app source is going to get to the package from uh, the current distribution you're running. So if you have Firefox and Debian stable, you're an app source going to get the source for the, the, the binary package you're using in, in stable right now, or whatever you get in your sources.list. You could have a, a sources.list for the Debian sources for, from unstable without, without having the binary package from unstable, and you, you'd get the, the source from unstable. Dget allows you to get stuff that is not there, that is not in that sources.list. So you, you, you could run dget on an arbitrary URL with, with a DSC file to get another package completely. And the good thing about dget versus just getting those bits one by one is first you don't have to get those bits one by one, <laughs> but also it's going to check the PGP signature on that file because the DSC file has a PGP signature from the developer, and dget's going to check that before it unpacks everything. Uh, so it gives you a, a, a kind of chain of trust. Um, there are other ways of getting that source package. There's like, you can git clone a package. You can dget clone. You can mercurial clone. You can darks clone. You can, you can you know, darks get or whatever it is. These uh, you know, there's like, I'm just, this is what I use right now, okay? Um, so, and when you're going to git clone a package, uh, the, the source code, you're not going to get the DSC file. You're going to get a regular source tree with all the source, well, not necessarily all the, all the source code, but preferably all the source code. Um, and then you will need to do a little special thing. You can't quite run just dpkg build package in there because you're going to have a .git directory, although the newer versions are aware of that, but typically you would use something called git build package um, that will kind of do the right thing for you. It will generate the DSC file, the original tarball, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then it would call dpkg build package and the build build and blah, 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 blah. Um, so we, I'm not going to go into depth into that part because it's kind of an implementation detail. And there are, again, many ways of doing that in Debian because in Debian people like to do things differently. Um, and so there is about three different git build tools here. Uh, this is the one I use, so this is the one I mentioned. But yeah, <laughs> just ignore all the other ones. Um, so any questions so far? This, this, from what I can tell from the audience, it's pretty straightforward. Um, before, actually, before we get to app get install, I'm going to get the eraser here. Um, there is another step I mentioned, which is the dput. When you get a dput something into the archive, or a PPA or a private, like a PPA, I think, is Ubuntu's uh, per personal private archive, personal package archive, package personal archive. Anyways, it's the thing that allows you to run your own uh, little archive on the side and publish unofficial packages that are still signed and has still have all the good mechanics that you would expect. And then you can have to install that from those. Once you install, um, once you uh, once you have uploaded those things and added the source of that list to your uh, configuration, you can app install from there. Yes. So PPA is not just for Ubuntu. It's also working with Debian. So PPA is not just for Ubuntu. Well, it's technically made by Ubuntu for Ubuntu, but you can use them in Debian. The challenge is finding the right PPA that matches the Debian releases, because Ubuntu uh, Ubuntu releases match Debian releases. They're based on unstable, a mix of unstable and testing. And you need to figure out which is which to pick the right version of the PPA for Debian. But you can totally use PPAs in Debian, yes. It's a little more difficult because in Ubuntu, you can just do PPA add or I don't remember where the command is, but you just PPA add and then just configure your source dot list that runs app update for you and everything. In Debian, the, the command is there, but it doesn't, doesn't quite work as much as you would expect. So you kind of need to 
figure your way. And I mean, I use PPA here in the broad sense. Uh, th this is the, the stuff on Launchpad, but you can, like, I, I, I've ran my own archives, you know, um, that are not on Launchpad PPAs. They're another thing. So you can have your own personal package archive that's not uh, hosted by Canonical. Um, OK. So this, this gets you, like, um, with those tools, uh, you can run Debian, you can install stuff in Debian, uh, you can upload new packages in Debian or upload existing packages in Debian, which would do nothing. Um, you, and you can rebuild packages as well. So I'm going to add another little, little tool here. Just to um, say you want to do a backport. So you want to take something that's in testing, bring it in, in, in stable, because you like the new shiny stuff, and you want to have it in good old stable. Um, what you would do is you would app source or deget the package from testing. You have the source package, and then you would do, run dch dash dash, BP, uh, dash dash bpo. And what dch does is it edits the Debian changelog, which is where the well, it's a change log, <laughs> which is records, uh, uh, records changes on a package, but it all, it's also where the version number is. And what this does is it creates a little special version number for backports and changes your source package, and then you can build it, and you can upload it for, to backports and install it. So this chain already gives you enough tools to make changes to Debian packages. You can make that by hand. You can, like Debian packages is basically the upstream source code with a little Debian directory, which is a bunch of text files with a specific semantics and meaning and different things. So you could edit the changelog by hand. You could add patches. You could modify the upstream source package and all that using those tools. But there are other tools that exist that make it easier for us to do that. Um, one of those tools is Quilt, uh, which I also mentioned earlier. So Quilt is something that Debian packaging, uh, that we use in Debian packaging to track patches. Like a Quilt is a set of patches. You know, it's like a, when you make a Quilt, you take a bunch of patches and you sew, it, sew them together. So Quilt is a way to order and manage patches. So if you have uh, a bug in a Debian package and you have a patch, you can use Quilt to modify the source package um, and add that patch and apply that patch and remove patches and you know inspect patches and so on. Uh, it's very useful because without this, the way it was done before is just, <laughs> it was basically just modify the source package and upload it. That was the way patches were managed in Debian before. Like, Debian package were effectively a fork of the upstream. And they're still a fork. It's just that at least now the patches are separate and you can see what they are. Before, you couldn't really see what they are. Um, and there are still Debian packages that follow that. Uh, in fact, there are other things than quilts. Like, there's, uh, oh, I forget the names now. But there's, a, like, there's dpatch. There's like about five of those tools here that historically have been used. But this is pretty much a standard now. The problem is that for older packages or packages that are updated less often, you will find other things than this. And this, those may freak you out. Uh, <laughs> but, and that's the problem when you go like uh, bug squashing or you, you do backports or you work on other people's packages, you find some weird stuff. I work with the Debian LTS project, for example, where we would find uh, older packages and weird things. And I have found packages that are not using Quilt. But in, in effect, you're not going to find that very often. Um, uh, yeah. So when you make changes to a package and you build it, before you upload it, you actually want to run a tool called Lintian as well. So I'm, I'm slowly filling up this board, right? And there's, it's going to seem like there's a lot of tools there. But those tools all have critical function. And I'm trying to not add too many tools. In <laughs> this is kind of the minimal set that you work on with a on a daily basis. So Lintian is going to check 
your, you can run it in the source package as well. You can run it on the source package or the built package. Um, and Lintian is checks for lint, you know, like a little dust that's in your pocket, and, uh, and, and checks for problems in packages and common errors, and it's going to warn you about the package. Uh, very often, many packages are not um, packages are not Lintian clean in the beginning. So if you work on a bug and you, you run Lintian, it's like, oh my god, there's 20 errors. Maybe you want to look, there's a log, like there's a Lintian.debian.org. Uh, anyways, whatever. There's Lintian.debian.org that has a directory of all the Lintian runs and all the Debian packages. So you can look if it's a new warning or not. And if it's not a new warning, you can just ignore it. You, it's not because you fix a bug in the package and you need to make the package perfect, right? So this is just an indicator. If you introduce a new problem, it's going to tell you about it. So is it like PEP8 in Python? Yeah, um, so PEP8, uh, for those who don't know Python very well, this is the style guide, right? Yeah. So it tells you you need to use tabs or spaces or we don't care and that you need to put the little and here in the semicolon there and the parenthesis that way. Uh, Lintian is a little, a little, goes a little further. It's gonna tell you, um, it's not just a style, style guide. It's, it, it actually tells you like this dependency is backwards or you're missing that dependency because you're using that thing over there. We found the typo over here. Like it, it goes pretty deep, it goes much deeper. And there's a lot of checks. And this is, this is a very important tool because it's kind of, like there's, there's this, um, like Debian is, has a reputation for having solid packages and that they're very reliable and you can upgrade and, uh, and it's safe to upgrade. And one of the reasons it's like that is there is a thing called the Debian policy that establishes how packages work. Like there's a very formal document that documents all of the, all the good things and all, all those good things are, are formally specified. Well, not most of them are <laughs> formally specified. And Lintian tries to check for all that stuff. It doesn't check for everything, but it tries to. So when you run Lintian and it finds problems, it usually means you, you, should, you should do something. Oh, and sorry. Sure, sure. Uh, like, d does it only work with Debian ecosystem, or is it something, if, like, if the source package has tests and things like that, would Lintian run them, or it's strictly Debian policy? Lintian does not run the test suit. So the test suit would ideally run at build time, in the dpkg build package. And then we get how packages are built, like, um, and the details, like there's dev helper and CDBS. There's a lot of things underneath that we don't need to get into now. But in theory, if there's a fairly standard test suit, for example, uh, in Python, if you run setup.py test, it should run your test suit normally, right? So uh, the Python build tools and Debian are going to try to do that. And they will try to run the test suit. It's going to run on the build host, where the package is built, using the build source. And that's not necessarily what you want from a test suit, right? So there's another thing that actually runs kind of over here. There's a bunch of things, actually, but I usually don't get into those details. But there's something called auto PKG test. Um, that's a program you can run on your, your own computer that's going to run either in a virtual machine or in a shroot or, you know, and we can get into shroots later as well. Um, and it's going to run on the installed package. So it's going to run tests on the installed package. So if you have a monitoring server, it's going to install the package and test if the web server was properly set up. And if it's monitoring things, for example, you know, it's kind of, you can run smoke tests and acceptance, acceptance, acceptance tests here. And ideally, the ideal package and program, in my mind, has a build time test suit. And when it's built, it can run a self-test when it's installed. Like the test suit is actually shipped with the binary package. And I've tried to do that in some packages that actually ship the test suit with my Python code so that you can run a self-test even when the package is installed and see if things are OK in the actual platform it's deployed in. And auto PKG test would actually use that. And there's another thing while I'm here that's, I have no idea how to pronounce that. Pi U parts. Pew parts? Pew parts. Pew parts. That's a Portuguese part. It's a Portuguese part. 
<laughs> I, I've, I've always read that word. I've never <laughs> pronounced it until today, so I have no idea. But basically, pew, pew parts. Anyways, that thing <laughs> uh, is going to take your package, install it, and remove it, and see what's left. And so there's a bunch of little tests that run like this as well from the archive that you can also run when you build your package. So I mentioned, uh, there are any more questions? I mentioned um, Schroots um, here, and it's something I should mention here. When you work on Debian packages, if you just um, get the source and run the PKG build package on your machine, you're not quite doing it right. Um, you should run the build in a separate environment. So in a clean environment, and uh, minimally, uh, ideally, ideally in a minimal environment, so that if there are dependencies missing that are not specified in the package, you, you would pick them up and so on. Because it's quite possible that if you're working on a source package, you already have all the dependencies for that package installed because you're already playing with it. And if you do this on your host, you're going to forget stuff in your source file and you're not going to notice. So you build in a separate environment. And again, there are about a billion ways of doing this. The one I ended up with is called sbuild. So sbuild takes a source package and then it runs that in the shroot. Here we see Thank you. Uh, <laughs> And then it basically, call, it basically calls the rest of the chain from there, right? It, it calls uh, build, build, dpkg build package and blah, 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 except it runs in a separate environment. It can run in a shroot, which is a, another install that nothing is running it, but it's just like something you set up with the bootstrap or whatever. There are tools to set up those shroots in sbuild, and the sbuild wiki page and the Debian wiki is kind of good enough to get you started with that. And um, it can also run, I mentioned auto PKG test can run your test in a virtual machine. Sbuild can talk with those virtual machines. It's kind of clunky and doesn't quite work, but the, the idea is that Sbuild has multiple backends and the shroot is only one of them. So if you run a build your things in an isolated environment, because you don't trust the code you're building, which, which you would think this is the way it would work by default, but it's not. Uh, there are good ways, of, there are some ways of doing that here. I haven't quite figured that out yet, to be honest, but ideally it is. Uh, and another thing, just before your question, git build package can obviously also call here and call this build and so on and so forth. I think that covers most of the tools, yeah. Does S build support with Vert? So the, the question is, does lib, has build support libvert? And I would defer you to the question of does auto PKG test support libvert? And the answer is it's complicated. Uh, auto PKG test actually calls QMU, which technically you can kind of use the libvert images you're using with KVM kind of thing. But the, I think the, the actual answer is probably no. <laughs> um, but Sbuild is a Perl package, and the, um, if people are familiar with Perl, I suspect it'd be fairly easy to implement that in Sbuild. I looked at the source; it's just this one, like there's one source, like there's a one source file for a uh, shroot. There's one for to PKG test. Could be possible to make one for libvert. Every time I go into Sbuild, it's just like, oh wow, this is super cool. This is super well designed. And I start doing things, I'm like, oh. I don't understand anymore <laughs> what's going on. But um, yeah, it looks like it, w it might be possible. Are there any other questions about this? Oh, yeah, I forgot the BTS. Where do we squash bugs in here? Huh? Because this is what we're here for. Where do bugs come in, and where do, how do we fix them and do things like that? Um, so I'm going to add. Um, the bug tracking system here, and then I'm going to wipe this entire board and do something. Uh, so when you actually work on a package, you make uh, changes to it with, you know, with a text editor and and quilt and um, and so on. Um, oh, and before before I go ahead, uh, this graph is actually here. 
in this little page. The dev that li quick dev is a little development guide I, I, I made to just not forget the way I do things, <laughs> uh, which I refer to. And then I kind of built that, but a little cleaner. And there may be stuff missing in there that I just add every time I do the presentation. I forget to add there, but whatever. Uh, so yeah, when you make changes, First off, you might take patches from here. People submit patches in the BTS by email. Um, the bug tracking system is a little weird in Debian. It's this old thing that was built, <laughs> built around email back when the internet wasn't synonymous with web, but it <laughs> involved multiple protocols. Um, so there are patches in the BTS that you can download, and you can import them with Quilt or, or whatever. You know, you can just add the patches and then build a, like, the package from the patch in the BTS. But you can also send patches into the BTS. So you can send the patch that you got from Quilt, but that's more, the, the patch you have in Quilt in the Debian patches directory is what you would send upstream more than what you would send Debian. What Debian people want is a debdiff. Because, and debdiff is a, a program that you run against two source packages. and makes a, It makes a diff between two source packages. And the difference is debdiff works not only on the upstream source, but also on the change log and the entire Debian directory. So if there are other changes other than the upstream source, this is going to pick it up. So when you actually work on a bug and fix it, you import the upstream patch that fix it, fixes it, or you fix the dependency in a control file or whatever. When you're done, well, if you're a Debian developer, like half the people here are, <laughs> you're going to go through the rest of the patent and you upload the damn thing. But if not, and you need a sponsor, or you need someone else to, to finalize that work, you can just, or if it's not your package very often, you can't upload it. You're, you're not supposed to upload it. There's not an entire thing about this, but basically you're going to send a debdiff. So you're going to do debdiff source package A dot DSC source package B dot DSC. It's going to generate you a diff file, and you're going to send that to the BTS. Debdiff can actually generate the entire email you just shove in an email client, which most people don't know how to do anymore because we don't have email clients. We have web browsers now. Um, but <laughs> amazingly, it generates a patch. You send the patch. Um, yeah, so that's the last tools I needed to mention here in this little graph of ours. Oh, yeah, there's this <laughs> one last one because people often ask me, so how do I make a Debian package, right? I wanted to actually learn how to package things in Debian, and you always start from the source package that already existed from, you know, from day zero. Like, how do, how do things get created from scratch? And... Um, Again, there's multiple ways of doing that <laughs> because it would be too easy. But there is something called deb make that's going to take the upstream source and add a Debian directory to it. And it's going to add little template files and all the little things, and it's going to create the first source package. And you'll need to edit those, those Debian source files. And this is where you're going to struggle with how do I package stuff that's built with Meson or Node.js or Ruby or I don't even know what that programming language is kind of problem. Um, and you're going to get into, you know, deeper shadows, of <coughs> the deeper horrors of how you build stuff in Debian. But I'm not going to get into the details of that now. That, for me, all those tools are what I use on a daily basis. Um, to build packages. I'm mostly, my, for example, in the LTS, my workflow is dget source. I apply patches with quilt, change a change log, run sbuild, get a .deb. I actually would just test it straight in a VM here. Whoops, that's a V. I would just have a VM, a virtual machine that would test stuff in directly by hand because half the time there is no test suit in the damn thing. <laughs> so, and yeah, run Lintian. When all is good, I upload to the archive, issue an advisory, and I'm done. That's an easy package. A hard package, this is going to take eight hours and require 40 gigs of disk, and it's called LibreOffice, and it's going to make my head explode. 
Uh, and when I test in a VM, and I won't be able to reproduce the, the, the bug anymore, even in the original package. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> your mileage may vary. Um, with um, backports, the exact same thing. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, I mentioned app source and dget and those tools in priority because uh, even if many packages, like a majority of packages I think now, are managed actually in Git in Debian, I mentioned this because it, it can, even if the package is managed in Git, you can still use app, app source to build it and to issue a diff and make a non-maintainer upload. You don't have to absolutely use Git or Darks or SVN or Mercurial or whatever the Debian developer picked for that package. But it's, the best the, it's the best practice to respect that. Yeah. And to, you know, if, if it's on Salsa, there's a thing called salsa.debian.org that's a GitLab instance. You can submit a merge request there. But this is not very established yet, right? Uh, it, some people don't look at Salsa for, <laughs> for that. They just dump their source there and they don't look at the issues there. They don't look at the merge request there. They don't even get them a notification, so they won't know about it. So the common, the, the, the lowest common de denominator for Debian development is you get a source package, you build it, you, there's, a, there's, a, there's a binary package, you, you, do, you run a dev diff on, on the <laughs> source package and you upload the result. That's the minimal common denominator. And this is why I introduce it like that. You can, you can just pretend everything is in Git. And this is what the Git, now the Git, the, the Git does, it operates on any source package in the archive like it's, a deb, uh, like it's a Git package. And it has an entirely different Git repository and Git history. And you can do that if you're like a super Git fanatic. You know, I won't only work with Git. You can use the Git. And if, and if you use, if, there, if it's a Git package, you can use Git. But what you're going to find very quickly is that maybe the package won't build, won't build with Git build package because they use Git BPM or Git, uh, Git, I don't know which Git thing they use. They would use a different layout for patches. And there, there's um, a proposed standard for the branch layout now. And there's, you know, we're, I think we're slowly converging towards actually something that looks a bit like that with Git. But the reality of a bug squashing party, LTS work, backports, of not working on your own stuff is that you're going to find a lot of variety. And it's important to get familiar with the foundational tools that made Debian what it is now. And I think, I think this is a good approximation of this right now. Are there any other questions before we go into box quashing 101? We can go a little uh, less formal for the second part, maybe as well, because I've been talking a lot. What was that? That was half an hour or something, 45 minutes? Yeah. So, bug squashing. Uh, so yeah, I put a bunch of links here. Uh, Release.debin.org, for example, is an interesting one. If we look at that thing right now, um, um, so that page is a little strange, to be honest. Um, so release.dibbon.org, you get the release standards section up there. You get five links. Uh, and <laughs> those links, I always have even trouble reading them. But the first thing is what they are for packages, what RC bugs are for packages. This is the definition of what a release critical bug is. Um, what they are for architectures is the qualification rules for a different architecture. Is ARM or PowerPC going to make it in the release this year? This is, this is not very important for us right now. Which of them aren't being met is the third link is what you actually want. There's a shiny graph there. The, the, like there's a bunch of colors. It's super exciting. This is, this is the shit, you know? Um, and right now, we're at this moment where a BSP is actually pretty hard to run. <laughs> we're pretty far in the release cycle. And the, the, you, you're going to notice the curve of the release critical bugs is a little bit like this. It starts from the last release, which 
you're at the zero point on the axis. There's zero bugs in Debian, <laughs> which is not true. There are critical bugs. There's always a billion bugs in Debian, but you know, we like to think that we have a perfect thing going on. And it obviously explodes and goes up like this um, to the hundreds of really critical bugs. And then since a uh, few releases now, I think two releases, we have auto removals in place, which means that certain uh, that most packages get removed from testing. They just get kicked out of the release completely if they have a release critical bug. So you have like a little like thing like this going on for a while that packages get bugs and then they get removed and then they get they reintroduced, they get bugs, they get removed again. And this goes on until the freeze, at which point the package gets removed and then they can't get back in. And the thing that happens is at that point is you get to a, you get to a line like this that evens out because there are certain packages that, like the kernel, that won't be removed from Debian for obvious reasons. They're called like essential packages, I think. There's a various, there's a different set of rules for the release team of which packages cannot be removed. And we're at this kind of line here that is harder to just drop like this because those are the core harder bugs that can't be auto-removed. We can't pretend that this is not an important package. We're just going to remove it from Debian completely and pretend it doesn't exist anymore. So this is going to be a little more difficult. Um, in that same page, so you see we have, we really see that flat line there in the end. Anyways, uh, we have 132 release critical bugs right now. We had 135, I think, yesterday. And at the very bottom there, you have a link that shows you a bunch of those bugs and you can just pick one in there and it's like, I'm a hero, I'm gonna fix that one randomly. <laughs> or you can, you know, do something else. Um, so that's the release.debin.org page. There's a UDD page. Uh, the UDD is the Universal Debian Database, which is, uh, oh, that's another word I can't pronounce to save my soul. PostgreSQL, PGSQL database uh, that collects data from everywhere in Debian and does stuff with it. So in the UDD page, there is a bug search page that allows you to search for certain bugs that's a little more useful for us. The first one is the BSP view. Uh, those are old bugs that we could try to fix. I've uh, asked the release team recently why, uh, <laughs> this says there are 16 bugs for the month's question party where there's 132 on the other side. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, there's a bunch of fields, for example, that look at only newer bugs. If you remove that, you actually get to more like 120 bugs. You don't actually get to the 132, so I don't know exactly what's going on there. If you're a Debian developer there, you could just look at patches, uh, bugs that have patches in them. So you could sponsor an upload or test the package. Uh, even if you're not a Debian developer, actually, you could just test that patch and confirm that the bug, the patch fixes the issue. Uh, if a bug is not confirmed, you could, even regardless of whether you are familiar with this maze of stuff here <laughs> or not, you could download the package and test if the bug is actually a real bug and mark it as confirmed. Uh, in the filters there, in the bug search, you get a bunch of tags, like confirmed, patch, pending, security, won't fix. The BTS has ways of adding a certain set of predefined tags to bugs that are kind of a way to track state on bugs. Um, the Debian Bugs Tracker has basically two states for bugs, which are open and closed. <laughs> uh, and then there's, everything else is kind of fuzzy field things. Um, you're going to have a fixed, I don't know how to call it, it's a field, I guess. So a fixed field is going to tell you in which version the bug is fixed, right? And when it's fixed in all supported version of Debian, it's, it closes itself automatically. But you can have a bug that's fixed in a, in a version and that's fixed in another. Uh, and yeah, the tags, you're going to have patch as a tag confirmed. Uh, security and so on. And there are also user tags, so you can have arbitrary key value things there, and we're gonna use that today to track the bugs we're gonna be working on. And the wiki page for this meeting, uh, there is the magic string you send to the BTS to do things. 
So yeah, I've been talking for an hour. I don't know, maybe we can take a break uh, and I can talk more later or just you have specific questions about how to interact with the BTS or stuff like that. I can go in any details you want. Uh, about the uh, phrase, uh, currently we are in the different phrase uh, 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 stage, right? And what normally happens? I know different phrase stage is that uh, it's a state that normal package cannot get into the system or only bug fixing. Mm -hmm. The feature the release cannot get in there, only the bug fix can, can get, get in there, right? How about then how about the new packages? Sometimes maybe during this time there might be new packages that they have to wait. They have to wait, absolutely. So in the release.debin.org page you have the last link is the freeze policy that tells you exactly what's going on. So uh, and the Debian release process is a multi-stage process. It starts with a, what we call a transition freeze that keeps transitions from happening. So for example, you won't be allowed to upload a new SSL version, <laughs> a version of OpenSSL or of a new version of the compiler toolchain because this is a complex process in Debian because it touches so many packages called a transition. So this happens very early. Then you get a soft freeze. And during the soft freeze, um, I, you, that's the point at which you cannot add new packages. But packages still transition between unstable and testing automatically, kind of. And during the hard freeze, which we are right now, there is no transition. Nothing happens anymore. <laughs> Everything needs to be vetted by the release team. So even me as a, as a Debian developer, I could upload the package to unstable, but it might actually create more trouble than anything because if it doesn't get approved by the release team, it's going to be an unstable and it won't be able to trickle down and we won't be able to fix that without messing around with the version numbers. So we should actually not upload to unstable today without the consent of the release team. So a lot of our work during the hard freeze is to actually coordinate with the release team, review stuff for them. Like if there are bugs with patches and we review them and say, I looked at this, it's good, release team, go. They actually like those kind of feedback because it can, they can, I mean, they look at everything that goes through, um, but it's gonna help them uh, get a better feel <laughs> about what they're doing. Uh, this also means that when you submit a patch for during a freeze, that patch needs to be very, very small. You need to strip it from whatever, like, like white space changes, uh, documentation change, like any, like you, you, you want to have a one line patch, like the magical minimal patch you can find is what you should send. Anything that's going to include like new upstream release that like, oh, I introduced this new feature. No, nah. no, 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 no. Forget about it. They, want, they don't want that. They, don't, they probably won't even look at the patch because it's too large because they have 30,000 packages to look at, right? So it's very, very minimal changes that are allowed at this point. You had a question? No. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So when is the re next release? When's the release? When it's ready is the official answer. Um, in reality, I think it might be a month or two more. Um, it really depends. Like right now, there's, um, uh, I heard there's problems with Wayland. I was talking with the release team this morning. I think there was something about Wayland causing problems. And there are like, there's a bunch of new stuff, right? Like there's a um, secure boot that came in uh, recently uh, that's part of the new release that could cause problems. There are, when there are hard problems, that are hard to solve and depend on a few critical people that are not necessarily very available. It can delay the release quite a bit. Uh, but it's all up to us. I mean, we can always jump in and try to help those teams figure it out. But yeah, at this point, 100 bugs or so. I'd say a month or two, hopefully. Could. It really depends. That's one of the things. I often start the bug squashing party by saying there are two teams in Debian. There are people that want to release early, release often, like we go, go, go uh, and break things and all that 
philosophy startup thing. And there is this gray beard. I have a hundred machines to upgrade every time we do this, so I don't want to do this very often. And those people during a bug squashing party are going to have completely opposite objectives. For example, I'm, today I'm thinking of upgrading a bunch of machines to Buster to see what breaks. And if things break, I'm going to file release critical bugs. And that will delay the release cycle. Uh, other people would be like, no, 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 we need a release. And they're going to fix release critical bugs as quickly as possible. So there's two tendencies. If you want to release slow, you're going to file critical bugs. If you want to release fast, you're going to fix critical bugs. So there's a, there's a, there's a tension there for sure. Uh, for example, I filed myself a critical bug on one of my packages last week because uh, it's an RC bot and the help command stopped working. <laughs> I was like, this is ridiculous. Like a, an RC bot without a help command is just like, like it's, not, it's completely unusable, so screw that. And those guys, they have upstream releases like, uh, you know, semantic versioning, you have a major, minor patch. Patch is supposed to be the minimal release, and ideally, it would follow the security team and the release team conventions, which are not the same, so it's impossible, but <laughs> ideally, the patch releases would be those minimal patches, right? Like, very, very targeted fixes. I fix the security bugs, I fix this critical bug. Those guys, they, they, they just make minor releases but instead of patch releases, but they mark it as patch releases. So, it's, and I can't follow them. So I'm thinking of just removing the package from Buster and maintaining it from backports because it's going to be easier for me, and then I won't have to maintain a freaking fork of that package. right? Because what you do when you release Debian is you effectively fork 30,000 packages and maintain them for about 5 to 10 years. Ideally, that fork would be an upstream fork. In the, case to, in the case of the Linux kernel, for example, Ben Hutchins is the maintainer, and he actually maintains, effectively, he's the maintainer of one of the LTS releases upstream of the Linux kernel. So ideally, Debian would follow an upstream release, an, up, an upstream release branch that is maintained. Very often, it's not possible, partly because upstreams don't like to maintain stuff <laughs> in the long term. They just want to run, it's like drop everything. We just go, 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 go. This is, this is what happens with Firefox. We, we need to actually follow the ESR releases, and that means major breakage sometimes. When Quantum came out, that meant uh, we ship the Quantum ESR releases in stretch security, actually, update. And that broke about half a billion <laughs> extensions, and people were pretty upset with that. But that was it. We were not. We, we tried to maintain the Firefox fork at some point. Some people talked about ISOL and ISOV here earlier. And that, that's a lot of work. I mean, I'm not sure that's Debian's job. So we prefer to follow the upstream branches. Sometimes that means trouble. Sometimes that means it's impossible because there is no upstream branch. Firefox is nice enough to do that. So go, we do that. Uh, yeah. So, so uh what if uh, Firefox releases ISR like after Debian release and then they stop maintaining it because it's like too old? Does Debian needs to maintain one of the older versions? So, so that's, what, that's exactly what happened during the stretch release cycle. We shipped with the ESR that was there when we made the freeze. Then Debian kept on living. Firefox dropped support for that, switched ESR, and we switched and followed. That's why uh, Firefox 60, that something is in Debian stretch now, yeah. So, but that depends. Sometimes it depends on the maintainers. In that case, the maintainers were like, no way. <laughs> There's no way. There's just no way. It's just too huge of a package. It's too hard to maintain. But that meant, that meant a lot of work because it meant backporting the Rust compiler tool chain in stretch because Rust was introduced in the Firefox code base all of a sudden, right? And Rust was not shipped with Stretch with a, a, a large enough version that it would work. So that was, that was a major, major challenge, just put it like that. All right, should we squash bugs? <laughs>